Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Luke Black, the chairman of the LGBTQ plus conservatives. Hello, good morning conference. Politics is many things. Of course, it's about delivery, it's about policies, ideas and philosophy, but it's also about moments in time too. And 12 years ago, a moment in time took place in a room not too dissimilar from this. It was a moment that a Conservative Prime Minister, David Cameron, said that he supported same-sex marriage. And he supported it not in spite of being a Conservative, but because he was a Conservative. It was a moment for our party. It showed to the United Kingdom what a modern Conservative Party could offer them. And what an offer. An offer that it didn't actually matter who you were or who you loved. You too could weave yourself into society as much as anybody else and build your family with the person that you loved. And that's an offer that over 40,000 people have taken up since the Same Sex Marriage Act came into law. But it was a moment for me. My name is Luke Rob Black and I'm the chairman of the LGBT Plus Conservatives. We are the wing for gay, lesbian, trans and bisexual conservatives. I joined this party when I was 14, but when I stood outside this room 12 years ago, listening to that speech and watching David Cameron speak on the television screens, it was transformational for me. A life that I never thought that I would live suddenly became a possibility, and that was a married life. Having the opportunity to stand in front of all of my friends and family and making the commitment to my boyfriend, Jake, and saying, yes, yes, I do. And that life was made possible by a modern, compassionate, Conservative Party. So being here, it's special, not just for me, but because of everything that has happened since then and could continue to happen if we stay on the path that we've been on for the last 13 years and elect Rishi Sunak and the Conservative Party for a fifth term. It's special because since that moment here in 2011, this government has continued to deliver for gay, lesbian, trans and bisexual people. It's more than just same-sex marriage. In 2020, it was a Conservative government that implemented mandatory LGBT plus education in schools so that children learn about people like me, a policy we should robustly defend. It rolled out one of the largest national rollouts of PrEP in the world, a drug that has truly been vital in the fight against HIV and should be expanded so that it can do even more. It funded the first and subsequent HIV testing weeks years of campaigning to fight unfair stigma towards those with HIV and towards testing. It was a Conservative government that implemented the Veterans Review and apologised for the first time to all of the gay, lesbian, trans and bisexual veterans that were treated appallingly before the ban on their service was lifted. We were the first country to hit the 1990-90 UN AIDS target, not once but twice, in 2018 and 2021. And it was this party that elected in 2019 the most openly LGBT plus MPs for any party, not just here in the United Kingdom, but in any national legislature for the rest of Europe. So whilst Labour and their leaders like Sadiq Khan think they can win my vote by putting a pride flag on a bus, I say this. This is the party that has focused on what matters to people. This is the party that has focused on how to make people's lives better. We've shown that we can deliver for LGBT plus people in the past, and I hope that we can continue to do so in the future. It is a real pleasure to open the conference session this morning for you all, and it is also a real pleasure to welcome our first guest onto the stage. That is the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Mr. Steve Barclay, MP. Hello. How are you? Thank you, Luke. As Health and Social Care Secretary, what drives me is getting people the care they need more quickly, boosting capacity, expanding our workforce, and embracing technology that will help them tackle waiting lists. But today, I also want to tell you about the long-term decisions that we are taking to support the NHS, to give patients more control and choice, and to take on those 
like the militant union leaders and Labour MPs supporting them on the picket line, who want to block these changes. We're taking immediate action to tackle challenges in the NHS and in social care, putting 800 new ambulances on the road, delivering 5,000 permanent hospital beds, and creating 10,000 hospital at home places for patients to receive care in their own home. And we're making the biggest ever increase in social care funding with a record uplift in the autumn statement last year. But conference, as conservatives, what matters to me most is not inputs, it is the outcomes for patients. And we're making significant progress with the help of new technology. Take strokes. We are using AI to speed up brain scans, meaning thousands of patients have fully recovered who may not have. And by the end of the year, this technology will be available in all stroke units in England. And we're also upgrading the NHS to offer patients a choice of up to five different healthcare providers, including independent providers, following a GP referral, which the patients' associations say can reduce weights by up to three months. But I also know that it can sometimes take too long to roll out new innovations nationally, even when they have been proven to work in local pilots. So today, conference, I am announcing the creation of a new £30 million fund to speed up the adoption of tech in the NHS. <laughs> this will enable clinicians to adopt proven technology that can improve patient care. And these could include new tools to detect cancer sooner, to help people receive treatment in their own home, or increase productivity to tackle waiting lists. Projects will be delivered in this financial year, getting benefits to patients as quickly as possible. We're focused on getting the very latest technology into the hands of doctors and nurses so they can benefit you when you need it. And that's the mission I share with my fantastic ministerial team, with Will Quinns, Helen Wakeley, Neil O'Brien, Maria Caulfield, and Law Markham, all supported by our brilliant PPSs, Gareth Bacon and Duncan Baker, and our fabulous whips, Faye Jones and Lord Evans. <laughs> the conference, I want to be clear. We want to give patients more choice and control over their care. And we can only do that with long-term thinking. Take our long-term workforce plan, the largest expansion in training in the history of the NHS. The first time in the history of the NHS that a government has been willing to set out a plan for the next 15 years for recruiting and training doctors, nurses, paramedics, and other vital staff. And to show we are already delivering on that plan, I'm delighted to announce today that we are making additional medical school places available at universities for next September. <laughs> Most of these places will be targeted towards three new medical schools at the universities of Worcester, Chester and Brunel, with further places for two universities here in the northwest, the University of Central Lancashire and Edge Hill. And this is alongside our new pilot for medical degree apprenticeships, a new route into medicine for young people yearning to train to become a doctor, but who want to take a vocational route because our party is the party of real opportunity for anyone, no matter where you come from. And our conference, our plan is not just about more staff, it is about using this powerful moment for reform using our Brexit freedoms, shorter degrees, new roles, and more ways onto the NHS career ladder. Better for patients and the taxpayer. Now, conference, my own background in the private sector taught me that organisations run more efficiently when they look at outcomes, not the inputs. Being focused on the end point means you cut down on waste. That's why I brought in Steve Rowe, the former chief exec of Marks and Spencer, to scrutinize our department spending. With a budget 
of £190 billion, there's always opportunities to get more resource from the back room to the front line. When I was appointed, I put an immediate recruitment freeze in place, which has reduced the department headcount by a sixth. And we are closing half of the department's offices. That's less money on the back office and more money on the front line. Now, to deliver, to deliver the long-term change the NHS needs, we need a relentless focus on patient outcomes. And that means prioritising frontline resources. It does not mean spending huge sums of taxpayers' money on diversity consultants or hiring bloated internal diversity and inclusion teams. And it does not mean ignoring patient voices, especially women's voices, when it comes to the importance of biological sex in healthcare. If we do not get this right now, the long-term consequences could be very serious for the protection of women and future generations. And conference, I know as conservatives, we know what a woman is. And I know the vast majority, and the vast majority of NHS staff and patients do too. That is why I ordered a reversal of unacceptable changes to the NHS website that erased references to women for conditions such as cervical cancer and stopped the NHS ordering staff to declare pronouns to each new patient. And that is why today I am going further by announcing that we will change the NHS constitution following a consultation later this year to make sure we respect the privacy, dignity and safety of all patients, recognise the importance of dialo different biological needs and protect the rights of women. <laughs> now, conference, conference, if all of that seems like simple common sense, that's because it is. And yet, every step of the way, we have faced opposition from the usual suspects when we were simply trying to do the best for patients. You probably saw some of them on your way in this morning. The militant BMA leadership, whose strikes have resulted in countless cancelled appointments and pose a serious threat to the NHS's recovery from the pandemic. Their consultants and junior doctors committee are relentlessly demanding massive pay rises, even if that means diverting resources from patients, and despite junior doctors having already received a pay rise of up to 10.3%. But it doesn't end there. They are even threatening to take the government to court over our plans to let patients see their own test results on their own phones rather than taking up a GP appointment. This clearly shows that the BMA leadership is not on the side of change and they are not on the side of patience. <laughs> and then there's Labour. Keir Starmer's MPs continue to join the BMA on the picket line. You only have to look at Starmer's own plans for the NHS to see that Labour will always bottle it and take the easy way out. When his own proposals on workforce were published, there was nothing on reform whatsoever. No shorter courses, no new roles, just more of the same. His shadow health team won't even back our rollout of new obesity drugs on the NHS for our primary care. Game-changing new treatments that could give people struggling to lose weight a real helping hand. Labour don't want to embrace innovation. Instead, the left like to lecture people and what they eat and drink. Look at Labour Run London. Sadiq Khan has banned Wimbledon adverts on the underground. Why? Because photos of strawberries and cream breach health advertising rules set by City Hall. And in Wales, Labour has banned meal deals that include a sandwich with a bag of crisps at a time when families are concerned about the cost of living. Now, Keir Starmer says that Wales is the blueprint for what Labour can do in England. But their record on health makes for grim reading. As a result of Labour's short-term thinking, 
patients in Wales are twice as likely to be waiting for treatment than in England. No wonder that the number of patients in Wales escaping to seek treatment in England has increased by 40% in two years. So the next time you hear Labour telling people that they have easy answers to the challenges our health system faces, remind them that Labour is letting people down in Wales. The conference, it's only by taking on those who resist change that we can make sure the NHS is there for us and our loved ones in the future. So let's stand up to a militant BMA leadership that does not accept the need for reform. Let's challenge the ideologues who silence the voice of women. And let's be very clear that we won't take lectures from a Labour Party that has utterly failed patients in Wales. Conference, we will achieve it by coming together as Conservatives, showing our values, our vision, our drive will deliver an NHS that gives people more choice, more control, and above all, puts patients first. Thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology, Michelle Donnellan. Thank you, conference. It's an honour to be here speaking as the UK's first ever Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology. The department that is working with industry and research to create the opportunities of tomorrow. I want to start by thanking my amazing ministerial team, our ever zestful science superpower George Freeman, the tireless tech titan Paul Scully, the Baron of Broadband John Whittingdale and our in-house entrepreneur Viscount Camrose and of course my brilliant PPS, Paul Bristow. When the Prime Minister created DSIT, some questioned why this department was a priority. But they weren't saying that when our tech sector worth over $1 trillion was under threat in February. When the UK arm of Silicon Valley stood on the brink of collapse, putting thousands of British techs that British tech businesses and jobs in danger. But in the space of just three days, my department helped secure the sale of the bank, saving those businesses, protecting those jobs. And conference, we continued to prove them wrong. We're utilizing science, technology, and innovation to help us all live longer, healthier, easier, happier lives with the people that we love. In the last eight months, over two million homes have been connected to gigabit broadband. By the time I finish this speech, 70 more one will have. Over 53,000 people have got new jobs in 31,000 new British tech businesses. And we've agreed a bespoke new deal to join Horizon. And we will protect 14 million children because of the online safety bill. But these aren't the only changes that have happened. We've crowned our new king. Labour have appointed another shadow cabinet. And I welcomed my baby boy in May. And yes, there's been plenty of late night tantrums, incoherent screaming, and dummies being thrown out of the pram. But I'm told that this perfectly is normal behavior from a Labour shadow cabinet. Now they flip-flopped on everything from the EU to schools to housing to ULES, in contrast with your Conservative government making long-term decisions for a brighter future. And we have an opportunity to make this Britain's great tech century. As Conservatives, our job is to make sure that this transformation remains a positive one for the British people, improving all of our lives. Let's not forget 
It was British inventors who gave us the telephone, the television, the jet engine, antibiotics, the World Wide Web, the first vaccine, the list goes on. But for too long, Britain has been a challenger nation to the US and China. We've seen too many of our great British ideas sold off to help foreign companies, rather than grow our jobs here in the UK. But conference, we have a plan. By the end of this decade, Britain will become a science and technology superpower. And I want this to be a country that becomes energy independent, that flies the first electric commercial plane and even discovers cures for cancer. Because when we double down on the things that put the great into Britain in the first place, our talented people, our entrepreneurial spirit, our ability to problem solve, we will lead the world with new inventions and keep those jobs on our shores. Because to me, that's what being a conservative is all about. Aspirations and ambition for our nation and putting the British people and British values first. Conference, just look at our game-changing online safety bill how it put you back in the driving seat of what you see and do online. When I took over this bill a year ago, many of us were concerned about the implications for free speech. It was stuck in deadlock over the issue of legal but harmful, and I didn't think it went far enough to protect our children. So I injected some common sense. I said, that we should not create quasi-legal categories where something can be legal to say offline to somebody's face, but where the state then clamps down on it online. Because I think that if we all believe that something should be illegal, we should have the courage of our convictions to make it illegal. So that's exactly what we did. With cyber flashing, with intimate image abuse, with the promotion of self-harm, whilst also standing up for free speech and choice and removing legal but harmful. <laughs> Illegal content should go, yes. Companies should stick to their own terms and conditions, yes. And not treat different parts of society differently. But fundamentally, I believe adults should have more choice over what they see, not the state and not tech executives thousands of miles away, because we are the party of free speech and we should stay that way. When I took over this bill, people also said to me it was impossible to strengthen for children. Well, do you know that the average nine-year-old has a social media account? and the average 13-year-old has seen porn online. I said, enough was enough. Now, the bill will protect children from online harm. It will ensure that children under 13 cannot access social media platforms, and tech executives will face jail time if they turn a blind eye. But as we protect children from the harms online today, we are, of course, also preparing for a future enhanced by artificial intelligence. Britain is leading the way on AI safety. AI does have enormous opportunities to cut down our NHS waiting lists, to support teachers, they've got more time to teach and less time to do admin, and to revolutionize our public transport and much, much more. But to seize these opportunities, we've got to grip the risks. Next month, Britain is organizing the world's first global AI safety summit, bringing together world leaders so we can better understand the risks of AI and put in place the guardrails to protect the public whilst also reaping the benefits and fostering innovation. With the Prime Minister, I set up the world-renowned Frontier AI Task Force, modeled on the fantastic Vaccine Task Force, with some of the leading minds on AI to ensure that the Britain really does lead the way on AI safety. Because the stakes are just too high and the technology is developing too fast for us not to act. Conference, I believe we should be proactive, not reactive. I believe that we are at the crossroads in human history and to turn the other way really would be a monumental missed opportunity for mankind. Already, 
AI is being used to detect breast cancer earlier. The capability exists to prevent over 90% of road collisions. And it's being used to detect heart disease 39 times faster. And that's just to name a few examples. The opportunities in the future really are limitless. But we won't be able to make them a reality unless we have the skills. And then we can truly seize these opportunities to ensure that the next generation of the world's AI entrepreneurs are Britain's best and brightest, I am today announcing an £8 million increase to the number of AI scholarships that we are funding, giving 800 more people the opportunity to excel in AI and cementing our place as leading the global conversation on AI safety. But as conservatives, we also must ensure that opportunities of technology are spread right across the country, from Folkestone and uh, Farmer to Hartlepool and Hollyhead. Why shouldn't an entrepreneur in a rural community be able to start a new business from home? Why shouldn't British farmers be able to use state-of-the-art agri-tech and have fast, stable internet connections to sell more produce to customers online? Well, we believe they should have these opportunities and I am today taking action to ensure that they do. I am announcing that in the coming months, we will be giving access to the very, very hard to reach rural homes and businesses to get state-of-the-art satellite broadband to unlock the potential in these rural areas. And I'm also announcing a new 60 million pound regional innovation fund, a cash injection that will be felt almost immediately. We will back our world-class universities to support local businesses, to grow local economies and support opportunities across our country. Right here in the Northwest, almost £9 million will deliver new jobs, faster growth and real benefits for local communities. And we will be increasing our overall investment in Great British Research and Development to, nine, to £20 billion next year. This is record-breaking funding. We are backing British scientists, backing British businesses and driving investment into all corners of our United Kingdom. This investment will open the door to the opportunities of tomorrow. Now, British scientists are consistently advancing the frontiers of knowledge with groundbreaking discoveries that are reshaping our world. Did you know we are the first in the world for producing the top medical science publications? We're second in the world for R&D into healthcare. And unlike countries like the US, like China and Germany, we're actually net exporters of pharmaceuticals. British scientists really are the bedrock of our great economic power. When I first was appointed in this role, I was reminded of Margaret Thatcher's scientific legacy. Now, I'm not talking about her legendary role in the invention of soft scoop ice cream but I am talking about her wise words as Prime Minister when she described science as humanity's attempt to cast a light ahead so that we may move forward step by step in the right direction. She was right. Conference, we are the party of facts. We are the party of evidence. We are the party of scientific rigour. And I will stand up for these core values. But increasingly, Thanks to the slow creep of wokeism, this guiding light that Thatcher referred to is under attack. Now, Keir Starmer has said that these issues don't matter to the public. He thinks that the legitimate concerns of the scientific community and of millions of Britons don't matter. Well, conference, I think it does matter. I think it matters when scientists are told by university bureaucrats that they cannot ask legitimate research questions about biological sex. And I think it matters when Scotland's chief of stats issues guidance stating that data on sex can only be collected in exceptional circumstances. And I think it matters when the ONS has to be taken to the High Court because its census guidance says it's possible to change your biological sex. I think it matters that in 2021, 
Police Scotland announced that a male rapist who self-identifies as a woman will then be recorded statistically as a female rapist by the police. Now, any credible scientist will tell you that gender and sex are two different things. To suggest otherwise is not only scientifically illiterate, it actually damages scientific research and statistics in everything from population studies to medicine to sport. And unlike Comrade Keir, we will not sit idly by and watch an intolerant few stifle the light of science that lead us in the right direction. So today, conference, I am launching a review into the use of sex and gender questions in scientific research and statistics, including in public bodies. It will produce robust guidance within six months, conducted by Professor Alice Sullivan of UCL, who will report to my department and also to Cabinet Office. The review will leave no stone unturned in the effort to protect scientific integrity and to let our world-class scientific community accurately get on with their jobs. So to those who think that they have the right to impose this utter nonsense on science, let this message today go out from this conference hall. We are safeguarding scientific research from the denial of biology and the steady creep of political correctness. We are making a stand before it suffocates Britain's very identity and our values entirely. This is why we are depoliticizing science, because science really is the most extraordinary force for good, from curing disease to growing our food. And we've got to keep it that way. Science must be based on facts. Now, finally, conference, delivery and outcomes are my focus. Last month, I announced a bold new deal to join Horizon, the world's biggest scientific collaboration. During the negotiations, Labour called on us to take the very first deal we were offered. They told us, bite the EU's hand off. Little Britain couldn't get a better deal. They talked our country down just to score quick political wins. And what did we do? We got an even better deal. And um, I think that says it all, really. While Labour act in self-interest, while they sneer from the sidelines and they say it can't be done, we are busy taking those long-term decisions and delivering. They said that we couldn't leave the EU and secure a better deal on Horizon. We did it. They said that we couldn't create a bespoke, common-sense, British version of GDPR that cracked down on endless cookie pop-ups. We did it. They said that the online safety bill couldn't protect free speech for adults and do more to protect children online. We did it. And we achieved these because we never lost sight of what it means to solve difficult problems in an unapologetically common sense conservative way. I believe in the individual, in opportunities, in hard work, in the family, and whilst others want to smash the foundations of Britain down, I believe that we, as Conservatives, have a duty to build Britain up. Now, that's what my department is all about, and that's what this government is all about. Consistency in our values, long-term commitment to opportunity, driving us forward for a better today and for our children's tomorrow. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Secretary of State for Leveling Up, Housing and Communities, Michael Gove. Good morning. Uh, lovely to see you. Um, I want to begin with a word of thanks. I want to thank you 
every single one of you in the hall, your friends, your family, the army of conservative activists, members, and supporters. Because it's thanks to you, your unstinting efforts, your energy, and your enthusiasm that we have conservatives in government. And we conservatives have a record that we can be proud of. Consider the facts. We have delivered. We've delivered better state schools than ever before, with our children the most literate in the Western world. And there are more students from state schools now at our best universities. We've also got more students securing top grades in maths, physics, and chemistry. Our universities are the best in Europe, and they're growing. We also have record numbers in employment. We've created one million more new jobs while in government, because welfare is simpler, fairer, and better targeted. We've taken hundreds of thousands completely out of income tax. Families have many more hours of free childcare. And since COVID, our economy has grown faster than France's or Germany's. We've also delivered the first national living wage, same-sex marriage, and the most diverse government ever. Stronger defense with two new aircraft carriers, new nuclear submarines, and a strengthened NATO. We've delivered the fastest decarbonization of any major economy. And we're world leaders in offshore wind, world leaders in reforming farming, and we have shown world leadership in protecting our oceans. Brexit has been delivered, and membership of the world's fastest growing trade bloc secured. And there is now more than 350 million pounds extra a week for our NHS. We're showing... Promise made, promise delivered. And we're showing world leadership in life sciences, in AI and in gene technology. We've delivered a points-based migration system. Crime is down, the union has been strengthened, devolution has been delivered in England, and nationalism is in retreat in Scotland. We delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in the world. We've been Ukraine's strongest supporter against the evil of Putin's regime. And we are every nation's indispensable partner in fighting for freedom, democracy, and a better world. We've got a record to be proud of, a conservative record, a record of delivery against the odds, and a record that every one of us should be proclaiming every single day from now until the next general election, because this is a record which will give us victory. And we will take the fight to the Labour Party, the party of Jeremy Corbyn, and his self-proclaimed friend, Sir Keir Starmer. Sir Keir, who was against Brexit, then wanted to accept Brexit, then wanted a second referendum on Brexit. Then he said that he wanted to make Brexit work. And then just last month, he said he wanted a Brexit which was actually identical to EU membership. He was saying, as he always does, whatever he thought people in the audience wanted to hear. Sir Keir Starmer is the jellyfish of British politics. <laughs> He's transparent, spineless, and swept along by the tide. <laughs> Under Sir Keir, Labour is the party of equivocation, procrastination, prevarication, but it is never prepared to stand up for our nation. It is the party of high unemployment, higher taxes, and always the highest debt and deficits. It's the party of low ambition, lower standards in our schools, and always the line of least resistance in the face of left-wing pressure groups at home and threats abroad. Well, we have a message from this hall for Labour and Sakia. We will fight, fight, and fight again for the country we love. And there is so much to love about our country. Though you might not always think that if you relied on Twitter for your news and The Guardian for your views. There's a fashionable tendency to, to denigrate our country, to denounce our past, 
and to see only decline in the future. But the country that the left depicts is not the United Kingdom that we know. This is a country which welcomes refugees from Hong Kong, Afghanistan, and Ukraine. A country which invests billions fighting climate change in the poorest countries in Asia. We fight poverty in Africa and tyranny everywhere. We're a country with the most diverse and inclusive conservative government in the West. A foreign secretary whose mom came from Sierra Leone, a home secretary whose family are from Kenya and Mauritius, a business secretary brought in Nigeria, and a friend of mine whose grandparents came here from Kenya's Indian diaspora, our Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. <laughs> Rishi is an inspiration to so many, and he is an example. He is an example of what our open, generous, great nation stands for. Opportunity for all, hard work rewarded, prejudice vanquished, service to others, and courage in the fight. We are so lucky to have Rishi as our Prime Minister, and he will lead us to victory at the next election. <laughs> For while we've achieved so much together, there is still much more to do. And I'm blessed that in that endeavour, I have a superb team of ministers and officials alongside me. Rachel McLean, reforming the planning system, fighting for more homes, standing up for small businesses. Lee Rowley, delivering more funding for local government and stopping the Lib Dem nonsense of a four-day week delivering poorer public services. The great Jacob Young, the engineer of levelling up, supporting our towns to flourish. Felicity Buchan, tackling anti-Semitism with our bill to end the stigmatisation of the world's only Jewish state by the far left, and our heroine in the Lords, the wonderful Jane Scott, a champion for the council tenants who've been let down by Labour local authorities. Can we thank them all? <laughs> and can I also thank everyone in this hall and beyond who serves in local government? Our councillors and former councillors are the stars who guide our path forward. The local heroes who are responsible for thousands of acts of kindness and leadership every day. Can we all salute our councillors and everyone in local government who do such a great job? <laughs> our councillors remind us that we win as a team. And as a team, we have so much more to do. We need to ensure that every family, every family, has a safe, decent, warm home. We need to ensure that many more young people can have a home of their own. And we're on track to deliver a million new homes in this parliament. But we need many more. And our long-term plan for housing will deliver the attractive, affordable new homes that we need. We'll build in the hearts of towns and cities and on brownfield land, because that cuts commuting times, it helps revitalise high streets and it protects the green belt. We will ensure that our new homes are energy efficient, zero carbon ready and built to the highest aesthetic standards. Because we're not just a party of opportunity and ownership, we're the party of beauty and nature. And that is why we will resist the proposals of the Labour Party and now the Lib Dems too, to build all over the green belt and to destroy precious natural habitats. Labour must not be allowed to take our fields, meadows and forests away from our children, and we will stop them. <laughs> Under the Conservatives, we will have a beautiful built environment and an enhanced natural environment. And by investing and building in our cities and towns, we will power the regeneration of communities let down by Labour in the past. Across the north of England, across the Midlands, across the whole of our United Kingdom, it's Conservatives who are levelling up, bringing high-quality jobs and high-tech companies to communities which were neglected by the left. In Redcar, it's a Conservative mayor, Ben Houchin, who's bringing 4,000 new jobs to Teesworks. In Walsall, it is a Conservative mayor, Andy Street, bringing new homes and new green jobs. In Blackpool, it's Conservatives who've secured millions of pounds for a new town centre, new college places and new hope. And we're also working 
in Mansfield, in Worksop, in Wensbury, in Lee, in Grimsby, in Accrington, in Dudley, in Ashfield, in towns across our country, which are the backbone of Britain, to bring new jobs, new opportunities, a new hope. In our towns, the values of hard work and solidarity, common sense and common purpose, endeavour and quiet patriotism have endured across generations. But our towns have been overlooked and undervalued by Labour, denied the support they need, denied the action against anti-social behaviour that they have demanded, denied the investment that they deserve. That's why we are investing in our long-term plan for 55 towns across the United Kingdom to ensure that in the country we love, no community is left behind. And we can make that investment because we made tough choices. And that is what government requires. And that is what Conservatives deliver. And Conservatives in government have never been more necessary than now. Because only we can deliver the long-term changes that this country needs. Only the Conservatives have the determination to stay the course and to bring inflation down. Only the Conservatives have the resolution to resist easy answers, avoid empty pledges, and make the right decisions for the long term. Whether it's resisting inflation-busting pay demands in the public sector, or tackling the eco-loonies who stop hard-working families getting to work, or facing down the faint hearts who say that we shouldn't try to control our borders, or taking on the enemies of promise in education, only the Conservatives are up for the fight. We are the party that fought in the past to bring positive change, that fought to clear slums over a century ago, that fought to lay the foundations of the welfare state 90 years ago, that fought fascism, communism and tyranny throughout the 20th century, that fought the culture of managed decline, low expectations and bureaucratic sloth that held us back in the 70s. The party that fought for home ownership, lower tax and personal freedom in the 80s, that fought to alert the world to the dangers of climate change and fought to uphold democracy in Ukraine. That fought to make opportunity more equal in the last decade for gay people, for poorer children, for those living with disability and for those from every background who believe in hard work and home truths. And we will fight at the next election for a kingdom more united, more confident and more ambitious. We will fight together for the country we love. Thank you.